listening to Cooper Talk. Welcome to Cooper Talk. I'm your host, Steve Cooper, and remember, I'm only as hip as my guests. And i got to tell you something, people. My guest today is a fellow New Jersey guy, and he's in a band I love. And I remember it was like, God, it must have been like 10 years ago, and I was living in L.A. at the time, and New Jersey had just got hit by a big snowstorm. So I'm posting on Facebook, you know, making fun of them and just giving them a hard time, and, and my friends were pissed at me, because as I was posting, we were going live, and my friends... <laughs> BMW driving down the 101 to go outside in Burbank to drink margaritas. And we were listening to this band. We were listening to his band. And now what's funny is, when, since I moved back to up from L.A. three years ago, when it snowed here I mean, last year, I got a lot of shit for it. But my guest is from a band I love, a New Jersey guy, one of the founders of Skid Row, and it's uh, Rachel Bolin. How you doing, Rachel? What's up, man? How you doing? Good. Now, I got to tell you, it's funny. You know, I, I talk about Jersey, and you're from... It's technically central Jersey. I mean, I'm, I'm in Cherry Hill, which is cl- close to Philly. But, yeah. you know, I lived in L.A. for so long that people don't understand, like, what New Jersey is. Because you sit there and they go, well, how are you an Eagles fan? You're from Philly. You know, you, you know you're from New Jersey. I mean, you, what was what was your allegiances growing up? Because you're, like, right in the middle. Yeah, well, you know, as far as baseball goes, you were a uh, – it's funny because the first baseball game I ever went to uh, – was a Phillies game. It was Philly and um, I guess against the Expos. That's how long ago that was. But uh, you, you were either a Mets fan or a Yankees fan. So I grew up a Yankees fan. Um, as far as football, you were Giants, Eagles, or uh, or Jets. And I was a Jets man. Now, what was it like for you growing up as a kid? At what point did you start getting into music? Was it something that you listened to an album? Because a lot of us that are over 50 remember our, our older brothers had albums. I remember actually going to a record store and just being fascinated by the whole album and the liner notes and the cover. What turned you on to music? Well, uh, kind of both of what you just said. I'm the fourth out of four kids. So uh, there was always music going in the house. You know, my oldest sister was into a lot of uh, the British movement, like Beatles, of course, um, Herman's Hermits, the uh, you know, it was all those bands, and, and um, so that was playing in one room. Go to my brother's room, Hendrix, Chicago, The Doors, Miles Davis. That was coming out of his room, and my sister Joanne was she was into a lot of folk stuff. Uh, Melanie, James Taylor, Carly Simon, Alvin Lee, stuff like that. And and uh, then there was me, and I started getting into the thing that really changed my life to being a fan of music to wanting to be a musician was kiss. And I think a lot of musicians that are in their fifties, that's pretty much the band that did it to all of us. <laughs> you know I mean, so, and then I grew up, uh, I was just into like glam and then punk rock came along and I was just like, Ooh, this is, a, you know, this is a game changer right here, you know? Um, but yeah, that, that, that really is what did it. But, but uh, <laughs> this is really funny that the, the uh, Big turning point, even though like I was always listening to music, big turning point for me was when I was about, and I don't even remember, I was somewhere between five and seven, I guess, and my mother and my grandmother love Liberace, so my dad got them tickets, and they took me, and it was at the, uh, the Garden State Art Center, um, which was so much smaller, and um, yeah, yeah. When he came out, uh, and I was just, I was a little kid. I was just so blown away by the reaction and just like the attention that guy was getting. And then, of course, his talent. But the biggest thing was his encore. He left the stage and I asked my dad, I go, do we go now? He goes, no, he's, he's going to come back out. So he comes out and it's all dark and he hits the court on the piano and his whole suit that he had had hundreds and hundreds of lights on it they all lit up then he hit another chord on the piano and the piano lit up with a million lights and then a candelabra came down i was just like oh yeah man this is cool i like this and just like the energy that was in the room i was like yeah i believe i could do this (laughs) you know you know it's funny you mentioned kiss and i remember it was a big thing trying to draw the kiss logo or try to draw the yes logo and then yeah then Kiss came out with an album, and there was a sticker in it. And I forget which album it was, and it was a 
like a razor wheel sticker. And it was cool. Rock and roll over. And if you had that on your notebook, it means you were cool, like you like yeah. music. Yeah, it's funny because I have that. I still have my original sticker. That was from Rock and Roll Over. <laughs> and uh, I have it on this. My dad built an enclosure for my stereo from when I was a kid. And I stuck that sticker on there. And it's still there, and I still have that enclosure. <laughs> <laughs> I have it in my studio. I put drawers in it <laughs> for chords and stuff like that. It's pretty funny. So so you, you, you know you want to play music. When do you pick up an instrument? When, when you, you saw the Barachi at five, of course, you weren't playing at five. Right. When did you pick up an instrument and say, man, I just want to, uh, I want to kick? Uh, I was 12, and I saw the, uh, the, the uh, program that came with Kiss Alive. And there's Gene just leaning back and he's holding his bass and, you know, all the pictures in Circus Magazine and Cream Magazine with blood and just fire. And I just brought the picture down to my parents. I was almost 12. I wasn't even really 12. I, I was, it was getting towards the, let's see, I guess it was around October. So I was 11. And I brought that picture down to my parents there at the dinner table. I go, I want to play what he plays. And they're looking at him. They look at each other. They're like, what exactly does he play? <laughs> I go, bass. And they're like, all right, well, let's get you lessons and we'll get you on um, for Christmas, uh, but you have to keep up with it. So, and you have to take lessons and you got to be serious about it. And they were very supportive. And I went and I took lessons for about six months. And I think they thought I was going to lose interest. I just wanted to move quicker. I didn't care about reading music. I didn't care about learning you know, Mary had a little lamb. I, I, I wanted to play Kiss songs. <laughs> and I wanted to play them now. So, um, yeah, that, that's what did it. You know, seeing that picture. And then I picked it up. And they, they saw that I wasn't losing interest. So I kept upgrading, like, every Christmas. Can I get a new one and trade this one in? And so that's what we kind of did for a while. Now, were you listening to people like Entwistle and, you know, there were so many great bass players back then, you know, I mean, and it's funny because when you see the old Stones videos, you know, Wyman and Charlie Watts are like just in the back and it's like they have their own little frat, you know, they're all by themselves yeah. just checking each other out. Were you, were you listening to other bassists or were you just listening to Gene? No, I was listening to other bassists. Uh, it once, like, my ear went towards the bass, then I, all the albums that I'd listened to before that, that's where my ear went like deep purple machine head you know uh, ian glover is like one of the best bass players on the planet and then there's uh, i'm sorry roger glover uh, and then uh dennis dunaway that was in alice cooper's band and then i started just listening to bands and my ear would automatically go to the bass and then you know new wave and punk rock came out and then joe jackson's bass player graham maybe was like, all right, this guy. And, and then, you know, like Paul McCartney and stuff. And so that's kind of where it went. And like I said, there was so much music in the house and four distinctly different record collections that I could go and just borrow this one and borrow that. And, you know, um, uh, my parents listened to a lot of Motown and stuff. So, you know, those bass players are sick. And you know, James Jameson and Carol Kay and stuff. So, um, yeah. I, I listened to a lot of different bass playing. Um, Gene was definitely the one that I looked up to the most and and played most, you know, similar to. But, yeah, I, I was into a lot of different bass players. Now, how did you form your first band? I mean, what was your – I mean, you know, everyone talks about high school bands, and I still – Bands. I still have friends from Facebook who have like they'll, they'll post a picture from like I graduated high school in '82, so there'll be like a picture of them in like '81, and it's completely different. Like they have like a dress shirt on, and they just look like nerds, man. Yeah. But it's like like for you, <laughs> when, when did you start forming your first band? Well, uh, it was that same year. I, I, I had turned twelve. Um, I was in seventh grade, I believe. And it's funny because I'm in my hometown right now, and I passed by my uh, middle school. And I was telling my girl, I was like, I was like, that's where I met my friend Damien in that courtyard right there. And she goes, is that the story where he came up and asked if you played bass? So I was like, yeah, he came up. He was really tall for our age. You know, he was already six feet at 12. And I remember him kind of hunching over because I was little. And he goes, he goes, you play bass? And I go, yeah. He goes, you any good? I go, yeah. <laughs> 
all cocky, and, you know. And so that we got together with another friend, this guy Jack, and we were kind of three piece, and, and we played mostly Kiss songs. I think we played Tush by ZZ Top, and we played Cocaine by Eric Clapton, and then out of nowhere, uh, Tonight's the Night by Rod Stewart. So we, uh, you know, that's what we did, and, and um, we, we started expanding the set list, like the ACDC and stuff, and, and Jack was the singer mainly. I sang a couple songs, but uh, yeah, I'm trying to think of the name of the band. Magic was the name of the first band. We named it after... Uh, that Anthony Hopkins movie where the, with, with the, the doll. Uh, yeah, the doll. And he kind of goes crazy. And so we named it after that. <laughs> so so you're, you're in a band, you have the idea, you love music. How does Skid Row happen? Cause you know, Skid Row, it's, it's funny you think about it. Skid Row has been around for a long time. Like, you know, bands yeah. and you guys have seen the hills and valleys of grunge yeah. and stuff like that, which I want to get into, but how does Skid Row come about what was was it an idea to be a cover band or or, or an original band or, or what was your thing when you got you and uh sabo hooked up well no we it was uh it was original um because i had a band with scotty hill at the time and we were all original and then snake had a band and they were all original and then he he split the band up or something but he was still writing songs and i met him and he goes hey man we're looking for a bass player and, and the, the band that Scotty and I were in had pretty much ran its course. Um, Scotty and I always staying close. We're like, man, I'll go where you go or you go where I go, you know. And, and thankfully, we were able to do that. But um, so, you know, we just got together because he worked in the town that I lived at a music store. So we got together and said, well, I'm the songwriter for my band. You're a songwriter for your band. Let's sit in a room and see what we come up with you know being that we're both going through transitions of bands so you see what this amounts to and that's how it started uh we wrote a couple songs and i started thinking i was like you know what he's like man i'd love for you to come up and jam and i was just like yeah you know maybe it's kind of far i'm broke <laughs> you know what i mean and so we um i ended up going up and we jammed and and it it went well, and you know we started switching guys around, and um, we were auditioning a couple guitar players. I'm like, dude, we got to get Scotty. We got to get Scotty. He's he's the dude, and you know um, it was, those guys were kind of reluctant at first because they wanted to be uh, just one lead guitar player and one rhythm guitar player. So Scotty came and him and Snake gelled so well, like their styles. And I was like, I know this is going to work. And, and I got along great. I was like, I know this is going to work, but I'm not saying anything because I didn't want to jinx anything. Because Scotty and I were very tight. And uh, so then, yeah, then Scotty was in the band. And then we just kind of just went from there, replacing the other guys and ended up Skid Row, um, the the you know, for the first album and such. And, and, you know, and just kept going, man. But yeah, we were never, we were never a cover band. We, we'd incorporate covers. We, we'd have to, after the first album came out with certain headlining shows, because we just didn't have enough time, uh, to, you know, we played all of our songs, but we still had like 15, 20 minutes to go by contract. So we had it through, you know, we didn't want to do drum solos and shit like that and guitar solos. So, we're like, well, let's learn a Van Halen tune. Let's learn. Of course, we did Kiss tunes, and and uh, you know, I think we did a couple of Aerosmith tunes, and you know, just just did that kind of stuff to fill time. What was the scene like back then? Because I remember, and I'm sure you played at the Galaxy um, in Somerdale, New Jersey, and I right. and people weren't familiar with the Galaxy. I did stand up comedy at the time, and you know, we all had a little bit of longer hair, but we had the, the comedy, like the, the blazer and shit. And we would go, always go, and we would go to the Galaxy after shows because there's always hot-looking girls in there. And the yeah. place was so, so metal. And it's like you walked in, it was like a different world. What was yeah. it like being part of that? Because I know you had the Empire Rock Club, you had Hammer Jacks in Baltimore, the Galaxy. I mean, what was it like for you starting to play these gigs? Uh, well, it's funny because um, the band that I was in prior to Skid Row called Godsend, our singer... Uh, by the name of Valerie Steele was from Upper Darby and the rest of us, well, Scotty was from upstate New York, but he pretty much lived with me at my parents' house. 
Um, so we were all from the Tom's River area. And she's like, we need to play out in the galaxy because we'd fit in really good. And at that time, Cinderella was, there's a huge buzz about Cinderella. And so we started playing and then they got signed and they kind of moved us in then. And they, I think they had every Friday, they, they had a standing Friday and we got every other Friday. And then Britney Fox came out and stuff like that. But yeah, it was cool. It was like, you know, these seedy little clubs, Empire Rock Room was always awesome. I played there in, in a couple different bands. And, um, uh, but Galaxy, we played quite a bit. And there was always that one, like, header over the stage that you'd smack your guitar head on every single gig. And I snapped off the the machine, the tuner on the, the G string. I had to play the whole night hoping that my G string was in tune because there was nothing to tune it with, you know? But that whole scene was really cool. You know, there's a lot of cool bands coming out at that time. Like, like I said, Cinderella and, you know, Skid Row wasn't around yet. But there was a connection eventually with Skid Row and Cinderella because Snake had auditioned for Cinderella. But they went with Jeff because he was in the neighborhood. You know what I mean? That kind of thing. And it, it, I guess they just thought it fit, fit right. You know, obviously I benefited out of that because if... if <laughs> He was in Cinderella. We would have never got together. We, there, you know, we wouldn't have done what we had done what we did. So, you know, fate. I was having this conversation with Eric uh, from Cinderella, and he's like, "Man, could you imagine if we said, yeah, let's take Snake?'" <laughs> he goes, "There, there would be so much music missing from musical history." <laughs> and I was like, "Man, that's really." really deep and scary to think about <laughs> it is it is so funny how like they call it happenstance happens because yeah you're right it's like the whole thing could have changed and there would have never been you know there would have been a, you're right a big chunk because you guys both make up a big chunk of that sound and it yep. would have just been something that you know snake may have not worked out with them it may have been a different sound and that's what that's what makes music so interesting yeah yeah it really is it's just you know the way it happened man it's just there's a lot of chance in it, but then once once it got solidified, we just worked our ass off. How how hard was it for you to get a record deal? Because you know metal was becoming big. I know it was just at the time the Sunset Strip, everyone was blowing up. I mean, but you guys were in Jersey. Did you get a deal pretty easily, or did you have to jump through hoops for a while? Well, it, it came easier than a lot of bands. I mean, we uh, had the luxury, obviously, of Bon Jovi being in our corner and John was, was really he was a champion for us him and Richie um, which led to being managed by Doc McGee and you know we, we we had a lot of good songs and those guys kind of nudged us it's like well they wouldn't just say here put this part in there they would be like you know what why don't you work on the chorus I think the chorus needs to be a little stronger and it was help that you just can't pay for you know what i mean and because you know these guys are proven songwriters and, and proven the success and and one day we we kept sending them our demos and and it was a while like there were there were labels interested in us but they weren't bashing down the door you know and, and snake and i would go to the city you know go to new york all the time in the winter or summer whatever it was with literally a bag full of cassettes and you know try to get in a uh, uh, meeting with someone or sit in a waiting room for three and a half hours and hopefully when that guy comes back from lunch we just throw everybody's name out there hey we know Doc McGee hey we know John Bon Jovi hey we know Rich Simbor the whole thing we're friends da, da, da. we played here and some people were cool you know and they'd be like well we'll take the tape you know whether they listen to it or not I don't know but you know it, it it worked out, and then some time went by, and the, the great thing about, and the, a very important thing that John and Richie did for us, and at the time it was frustrating, and it would make me mad, but looking back, they would just be like, you're not ready. You're not ready. You're not, and when you're a 22-year-old kid, and you could see success just right over the edge right over the, the, the you know the hill there and someone keeps telling you that you're not ready you're not ready you're just like 
you get so frustrated. But that was so important to us because we weren't. We weren't. And they, they're like, stop giving people demos. You guys aren't ready to play these for people. And we thought they were great. So we thought we just wrote, let it be with some of these. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and it's like that, that was so, so important. And one day they called. They were in the car together. And they called. They go, okay, it's time to get a record deal. You guys are ready. Yeah. And it was it was a big day, man. We were just like, all right, let's go for it. Now, do you think, because, you know, nowadays everything, you can send things through YouTube and Internet and stuff like that. Do you think it made you guys want it more because you really had to pound the pavement? It's not like you sit there behind your keyboard and go, oh, yeah, well, okay, I'm going to send 47 messages with a clip of my song to all these record companies. Do you think it made you guys tougher just because you had to sit there for three hours and you had to sit there and go, Christ's sake, man, if something doesn't happen, we're screwed. Yeah, I think it did. And I think that's how every band should still do it. I, Dude, I'm going to tell you right now, I, I don't like the internet. I use it because I have to. But I just watch how things are done now, and I'm like, and, and I'm not taking anything away from the talent that's out there because there's a lot of talent. But, man, there's something about, and being from Jersey, too, as you know, you, you, ha- you have to have thick skin coming from jersey because if you don't you're, you're just screwed but there's something about getting on a bus that smells like piss and puke and cigarettes and going to new york getting out of port authority in the freezing cold and then not being able to afford a cab because you need the bus fare back so you walk and you freeze your ass off and you do whatever you can man it just makes you so much more passionate and, and just so much more attached to what you're doing and to me it made me feel that we're so much more responsible for what we created does that make sense oh yeah i mean well i think it's anything you're right it's, it's that extra instinct man it's you have to deal with the surroundings and, and it's something you know and like entertainment acting has changed where people now do taped audition it used to be you go in front of a bunch of people and if you look like their old boyfriend they're like oh, screw this person we don't want to give him a part and now yeah. it's like everything even the process per se acting is before it was you got to do you got to do that scene in one take now they can chop it up and digitally and, and digital and digital and digital yeah yeah I, I just I like the real stuff man <laughs> <laughs> Now, now, when you when you got the deal, when you when you start recording the album, what were your guys? I mean, we we all have you know, we think everything's going to be great. But what were, what were your actual visions of? What did you expect to get from the first album? I mean, did you expect it to just blow the fuck up? I mean, seriously. Well, no, no, hoping it would, yes. Knowing it would, no. Uh, it, it, it's like you know because. My whole life, all I thought about was, you know, being in a, a successful band. Um, not so much about being a quote-unquote rock star, but just being in a band that everybody liked and being able to go on tour and be able to play in front of a bunch of people and being able to write songs that people dug. So in your head, all that time, yeah, you're doing all those things in your head. You know, you're on stage every night and all these songs are on the radio, even before anyone's even heard so that that's the dream and that's the vision and then once it starts happening you're like and it it, and a lot of times it happens exactly how i imagined it you just have to sit back and reflect and go wow this is unbelievable man this is unbelievable like here's a for instance okay so seaside new jersey used to go there all the time in the summer i live i used to hitchhike there i live so close so They'd always have, uh, you know, with the the spinning wheels, the games, you know, you could win albums, you could win eight tracks, you could win cassettes, um, you could win a poster of a band, but they'd always have the the bands that just released now blaring out of the stands, like wherever you go. I remember being little, I'm going, someday I'm going to have a band that's blaring out of there. I'm going to do this, and someday I'm going to be listening to that. And some of my friends were like, yeah, man, yeah. Some were like, there's no, you ain't got a better chance of getting hit by lightning. This is never going to happen. So I went up with a few of my friends after the first album really broke. And we were walking down the boardwalk, and it was it was at that point 
where it was really weird because we were very popular, and so I wore my hat, a hair up in a hat, which was just really weird and embarrassing for me. Like, I felt like a complete idiot because, you know, this is where I grew up. But that said, we walk, we just walk up the ramp onto the boardwalk over by JR's, and I hear Rattlesnake Shake off the first album blaring down the boardwalk. And I look at my friend. He goes, I was there when you said it, dude. I was there when you said it. And, man, and still to this day, it gives me chills telling that story. And it was just so cool. It was such a good feeling, man, and, and to have that happen. So, how, how did Sebastian end up joining the band when you guys were in your, in your younger area? Um, well, we, we were looking for a singer, and we auditioned quite a few, actually. We had a lot of tapes that we... You know, we just said thanks, but no thanks. But we auditioned, I guess, about four guys um, that we weren't crazy about. And a friend of ours, Dave Feld, who ended up working at Atlantic Records for a time, um, he was Mark Weiss, the photographer. He was his assistant. And so uh, I guess Sebastian jammed at Mark Weiss's wedding or something. And this is before we knew Mark Weiss. And Dave called us. He said, you might want to try this kid out. He, um, he He's a little rough around the edges, but he, he's there's something there. So we did, and it worked out. Is it hard bringing someone new into the band when you guys were like, you guys were the backbone? You know, you, you founded a band. Is, was it hard to bring in a singer? Because you guys know what you can do, you know, but the singer really has to deliver your goods because you guys are writing it. Right. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's, that was the situation with us. Like we wrote and he sang, you know, um, snake and I were right 90 to 95%. We write the bulk of the music, the song. So, um, yeah, it is weird. Um, but it, it translated easily enough to where he was able to pick up on it pretty quick. Now you're getting bigger. The album's selling, you start going on tour and you're not playing, the clubs, you know, you're not playing the Galaxy or the Empire. Tell yeah. me about some of the early tours, because you're up for some great bands, and, and it must have been uh, pretty cool to work with these people, because they're probably people you looked up to. Yeah, man, I mean, going out with Bon Jovi for as long as we did, they, they were buds, you know what I mean? Uh, especially with Snake, because Snake grew up with John, and, and um, he knew Richie, and he actually knew Teagle. He actually told John about Richie, um, when John was looking for a guitar player. Uh, so, uh, yeah, that was really cool. So you always had your friends around and we became very close with them and, and with their crew and they treated us just great, like just amazing. And we were out with them for a long time. And then, um, doc had said, Hey, um, we, you know, uh, the crew was going to Europe to finish up the tour that they didn't, I guess, I guess Dr. Feelgood was just about to come out or they were working on, I forget, but they, anyway, they were finishing up the girls tour that they didn't get to finish because I guess they all went to rehab. I don't know what the hell it was, but anyway, they were going over to do that. And, um, doc is said, yeah, we're going to put you out with Motley Crue in Europe. And we're like, cool. So we're, we're, we're like, man, <laughs> we're going from one huge band to another huge band. And we went out and just, that was really fun. You know, I, I didn't know those guys real well. Um, uh, but became buds, not obviously not as close as, uh, uh, to Bon Jovi guys, but then we're like, okay, we're going to go home. And we thought, we're going to go home and chill and probably start writing another record. And then they're like, no, Aerosmith wants to take you guys out. And for me, I was like, the, the only other thing you could say is that Kiss is going to take us out. <laughs> you know what I mean? Or ACDC. Because <laughs> now, now th these are the band, like, you know, I, I, I like Bon Jovi and I like Motley Crue, but I grew up and I cut my teeth on Aerosmith. You know what I mean? I was, and Tom Hamilton is another of my huge influences. So for me, I was just like, you got to be kidding me. And when we went, it was pretty amazing, man. And we were out with them for a while. And they actually wanted to bring us out on another, on the last leg of the tour. 
and we had we had to say no and so they took Joan Jeff but um the reason we had to say no is because we had to just start working and we had we had circled the globe so many times at this point we're out for the better part of two years and we we've hit so many markets and we didn't want to burn out so but man that no because they they came up with this plan so they sent each guy according to the you know steven went to talk to sebastian tom hamilton came to talk to me joe went to snake brad went to scotty and joey went to to rob and they were all like yeah you guys should come out trying to make it sound like it was really casual but it was planned. <laughs> they were just like, well, let's separate them. <laughs> let's, they're strength in numbers. If we separate them, one of them's bound to say yes. So we were just like, oh man, Doc doesn't, doesn't want to keep us out again. And, and yeah, that was that was rough when when your, your idols are saying, yeah, you guys should come back on. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, be honest with me. You know, we all hear stories, and you know, Jeff from Cinderella told me some stories about, you know, Richie Zambora taught him some things on the road about at the spectrum where you could hook up with a girl and stuff like that. Um, what was some of the debauchery like, man? Be honest, because, you know, you guys were uh, you guys were a happening band and it was a time where people people weren't so uptight. I always say there wasn't any political correctness because no one was dicks. You know, we were just like good people. What was it yeah. like, like for me? And you were a young guy and you guys, I mean, yeah. what was it like at that time? Well, for me personally, I, my, my, I was, I, I drank, I didn't, I, I've never been, a, a, I've never been into drugs and I didn't really smoke weed. Um, but drinking was my thing. I, I like to drink. I still like to drink, but drinking and, and women were my thing, man. And it was just like, and when you were out with Bon Jovi and you got like 85% female in the audience and you know you're 23 years old, and you're on MTV. You're just like, yeah, <laughs> I can't believe I could get used to this. You know what I mean? So yeah, that that's where it went with me. And, and it, none of us were really. There was a couple of us that that got into the things a little harder than booze. But um, you know, we didn't. We we trashed an occasional dressing room. Or hotel room. Snake and I were bad at hotels. I, yeah, I forgot about that. Him and I could do some damage in hotels until we got the the bills. And you know, Doc is just like, uh, you, okay, you're having fun, but <laughs> you guys just did you know three grand worth of damage to your hotel rooms when we used to share. It's like it would be easier if you guys just paid for your own room. It would be cheaper <laughs> if you did that. <laughs> you know, and we we're like, yeah, we better stop doing this, but. Yeah, you know, nothing, nothing too crazy. Now, you get you're traveling, you're traveling. Now you have to get back to the gear for the second album. Are you are you worrying about the sophomore slump or the jinx? Because the first album was huge. You've just performed. I mean, at crowds, which you know, I mean, you're playing with bands that are just loved, and the people are loving you. What is it like when you sit back and get into the studio? Because the responsibility is mostly on you and Snake to to get the writing done. Mm. Uh, yeah, you know what, everyone, uh, I heard the term sophomore jinx, and I just ignored it, and then people kept saying that to us, and saying that to us, and it started to get into our heads, we're like, well, you know, let, let's just, let's just chill, and we'll, we'll, you know, when ideas come organically, they'll come, you know, and it, it, you know, people just kept saying that to us. We're like, stop saying it. So it's, it kept slowing the process. And then uh, we get together and jam and we had ideas and whatever. But then all of a sudden Snake and I just started, like things just started coming out. And, you know, monkey business, he goes, man, I wrote this riff and a few different parts. Uh, why don't you come over and we'll start throwing down some some lyrics and melody and i'm like okay cool and he played it for me i go give me a minute let me go in the other room and just start jotting stuff down and so then that song came and then all of a sudden uh you know we started writing quicksand jesus which was just very different for us because it we disagreed on so many different things on that song which usually we'd just be on the same page right away and that song took us almost a month to finish and that that's the only song that's ever done that and in the midst of that, Desert Storm happened. So, like, what we were thinking became so unbelievably realistic, what we were talking about in the song. 
So that, that you know, and then just stuff just started coming out like crazy, and all these riffs just started coming out of us, and and we went into I think we were rehearsing in Rob's basement at the time, and we just uh, man, it just started coming out, and then next thing we know, yeah, my battery's getting low. Um, I'll get my charger if it gets too low, but uh, I'm gonna grab it anyway. Um, but yeah, so it, it would just. It just started coming out. Next thing we know, we have, you know, 15, 20 songs, and we're ready to go in the studio. And then we go in the studio, and it goes really well. They, <laughs> the stipulation was, do not put us in the middle of nowhere again to do this record, because the first record, they wanted to keep us away from any distractions, so they put us in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, where there was no distractions. Like <laughs> there was nothing to distract. Unless you played golf, there was nothing to distract us. So we did that. We're, we're like, don't do that to us again. <laughs> you know, that's when we started learning, Hey, we actually uh, can make some of these decisions. So they put us in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Well, <laughs> that was, uh, yeah, that was pretty insane. Driving cars way too fast. You know. Now, what was, what was, when you guys would write together, was it did, were you like said okay I'm gonna do this I'm gonna do this or I'm gonna do the lyrics I'm gonna play did write the bass parts or you write the guitar parts How did you guys write as a team? Well, um, I, I do write a lot of the lyrics. Snake is like I would say musically is fifty fifty. Melody is probably more on Snake side. Lyrics are probably more on my side, but I have to say this one thing lyrically with Snake. He always seems to come up with the perfect opening lyrics for a song. Like, he comes up with with a line, and I'll be like, you just painted the picture. You just set the tone for this whole song. He, he does that a lot. And so when we still write, I was like, give me the opening line, man. <laughs> you know, so, um, but... Yeah, so we, we never really had a formula. It just would happen, you know, like, hey, what do you got? I, well, I have this riff, this riff. I really like this riff, but not married to, you know, and then we just go back and forth, and and, so, and I'll do the same with him. Or, you know, Scotty Hill will come in or send us a riff, and we're just like, oh, man, let's build around this. And, and that's just how we always did it. So the second album does well, but now that's when it's starting to change to grunge and it's, the signs are changing. As a musician, what do you do? Because, you know, it's like anything. It's like when coronavirus came. We didn't think it would last this long. You think, oh, it's going to be here. And you're probably thinking, you know, well, grunge is happening. Yeah, it might be around for a little bit. But what do you guys do as musicians? Do you sit there? Because, you know, you weren't the glam metal. You were harder than that. So it wasn't like you were just, you know, hey, guys with big hair or whatever. You know, you, you were you were a rocking band. Where, what, where were your heads at when, when you started seeing the landscape change? Well, um... We were we were a lot uh, like we were heavier than most of the bands and just and I don't mean more metal but just, yeah we were just we we're rougher we were than a lot of other bands that came before us that were but we got categorized as glam you know um, and to me like there, there's two phases of glam there's Kiss Alice Cooper Dolls T Rex Bowie that's glam to me poison and whatever that's not glam it's just it's just rock whatever and, and uh, so but when grunge started coming out i who was it? i think it was tracy guns he had played me an advanced copy of nirvana um and this is this is during slave because uh when we were over in europe and he had an advanced copy and this is how i guess it was 92 and LA Guns was open for us, and we always used to get together uh, at, in each other's hotel rooms and just play punk rock CDs and cassettes, mostly cassettes because there wasn't a lot of punk rock on CD. And uh, so we play, and he goes, "This is a band. They're kind of punk." I go, "What's their name?" He goes, "Nirvana," and he put it in. And I was like, "This catchy as hell." I said, "I wouldn't really consider punk." He goes, "I don't consider it punk." He goes, "It just kind of has punk ideals, you know. It's like." really gritty and it's not a singer singer and it just it gets a point across 
I go, yeah, it's cool. I go, what label's it on? I was expecting him to say some independent label. He goes, Geffen. I go, we're screwed. <laughs> he goes, why? I go, they're on Geffen. He goes, yeah. I go, this band that is so raw and just so, like, it's deep, but it's simple at the same time. I go, we're screwed. <laughs> and, man, and then that changing of the guard came in, and, it got to the point where I never really even said I was in Skid Row at times because uh, I remember one time I rented a car from Enterprise and I drove the rental back and the guy was driving me back to my house. He pulled up and he goes, yeah, my friend's an idiot. He told me some guy from that, <laughs> that lame hair metal band <laughs> lives here. And I'm like, Oh, that's ridiculous. <laughs> so I got out of the car and went my house. Oh. So what's what's your what's your game plan then though? Because you guys are musicians, and you know it's like, and, and you know you grew up listening to classic rock. You listened to punk, so you know you had that whole idea of music. What what did you guys think was going to happen then? We, well, we didn't really have a game. You know what I mean? Because things were changing so rapidly. Uh, we re- didn't really have a game plan. And with what was going on internally, this was just like someone standing on the coffin lid. You know what I mean? And, and it, it, so there, were, there was really no plan. We, we weren't going to write to try to compete um, because it just wasn't us. And then eventually the band broke up during the, the, uh, while all that was going on. And uh, that, that's what happened. They just, that that grunge came in so strong. And so it was just like a juggernaut, man. Oh, my God. It was crazy. Why did you guys break up? I mean, what was it, was what was the main reason? Was there a, a <clears throat> certain factor that took place? There, there were just, you know, where we used to have the same vision and be on the same side and play for the same team, it, it became very different with a couple uh, members. It, it just it just, it just wasn't the same as it was, which it never is, but it, it just, it, everyone was just thinking in different directions pretty much without talking shit about anyone in particular. It's just, it, that's just what happened. And it, band grew apart i remember when we went to south america and we were on a couple and we we were like the band without a country you know we went to south america and and we got put on a metal fest then it was iron maiden who we had played with before in donnington years before and everything was fine and then when we went to south america we were on with them biohazard motorhead halloween King Diamond and Merciful Fate. He did two sets in the same festival. And I was like, where does I remember you fit in with all this? And I'm like, I remember telling Doc, I was like, dude, what is this? He's, he's like, ah, you'll be fine. And, that, you know, everyone's kind of losing interest. The label was losing interest. Management was obviously losing interest. It's like, you'll be fine. Well, we weren't fine. We, it was, it was the most horrible week of my professional career it was bad man and we did one show on our own and it was at a smaller venue and that was fine but like the majority it was just like it was it was stuff that never happened to us at festivals it was the stuff we had nightmares about happening to us like just people throwing stuff at you and just it was it was terrible and we got off that plane and we all just grabbed our bags and we looked at each other, didn't even say goodbye, and that was it. We each got in our own limo, went home, and that was it. So what do you? What's your plan? Of, so that happens. What you know? You're a young guy. You know, mm-hmm. you're a musician. You know what? What do you decide to do then? So we just we just all went our separate ways. Um, we, you know, Scotty. I, I started a band. Scotty started a band. Snake was doing some stuff. He built a studio, had people in it, and then those Rob and Baz did their own thing. And time went by, you know, and we, Scotty, Snake, and I started a band 
and had a couple other guys. We weren't trying to be Skid Row. We didn't do Skid Row songs. We are just doing our own thing and got a lot of interest from labels. And, you know, it was, it was happening, but it was slow going. And just back then, uh, um, you know, we just first <laughs> had email and stuff like that. And we just um, kind of got inundated with fans wanting to hear Skid Row again. And so we, you know, Scotty put it best. He goes, we knew we wanted to get back together, but we wanted to do it different. And that's what we did. And we got the band back together. And lo and behold, the first tour was the Kiss Farewell Tour. What, what is that like for you? I mean, you know, you, you, you know, it's Gene. You know, I mean, I mean, it's something that it's not. I think because I don't know if Ace was still with them then, or if was Kulik was with them yet. But for you, it's... oh no, this this was after all that. This was they got back together. They did the reunion. They did another tour, and then this was their farewell tour. Um, so it was Ace, Peter, Gene, and Paul. What was that like for you to play with the guy who got you it, into music? It was mind blowing. I mean, and it wasn't. And it was Kiss as a whole. Gene got me into playing bass, and Kiss as a whole just. They were my band, man. They were just the, the, the band that, that changed my life. And, you know, we knew Gene and, and whatnot. And Paul, you know, I'd see him at shows or whatever, and, and very nice guy. And we knew Ace. We actually um, sang back up on his, one of his records, one of his solo records. But then we got the chance to play, and we were like, holy crap. You know, this is this is unbelievable. So we were only supposed to do uh, one month, and then we ended up doing um, most. Uh, I think all of U.S. and Canada. So we were out with them for a while, and it started um, Kiss, Ted Nugent, Skid Row, and then Ted Nugent. Only, uh, I guess the last four months, Nugent wasn't on, or last two months, I forget what it was. So it was just. Kiss and Skid Row, and man, I think, I want to say we did 90 shows with them, I think, and I probably watched all but two. And that's only because we had, we played a couple doubles, and we had to go do our own gig. Now, what was it like, though, at that time, when you come back from, you know, you have a long history together, when you have a new lead singer? You know, what is it like as a band? Because, you know, I mean... Sebastian was, you know, the lead singer who's very loud and flamboyant. You know, it's just you, you, when you hear Sebastian Bach, you know, it's like when you see him on TMZ drunk screaming on Sunset Boulevard, you got that Sebastian Bach. I mean, it's just it's just the way it is. Uh, right. What is it like when you get a new frontman? Is it how long does it take you to trust? Like when you had Johnny join the band, how long did it take you to trust him? Well, um, not long. We just said, dude. You have to, you know, because he, he, you know, he played a lot, but he didn't play on this scale as we did. And he didn't have the, the, the heavy duty touring experience as we did. So we just said, man, first of all, you have to pace yourself, you know, pace yourself with partying, pace yourself just with, when we go out on stage and, but just learn to read a crowd quickly and just trust. We had just trust in what we're saying. And just be your own person. And that's what he did, you know. Um, he, he wasn't the flamboyant guy. He wasn't <clears throat> the screaming guy and stuff like that. And, it, you know, it, it was refreshing. And, and just, you know, it was it was cool. Because it, it was, you know, five guys just going out there and, and uh, raising some hell. And, you know, playing music really loud. So then, since then, he left, and then you had Tony Harnell, but Tony never really started. Then you have another lead singer. How do you go through the process? Like, is it is it like a breakup? Like, you know, okay, so Sebastian, you broke up, and then you find a girl you like. You know, it's like a marriage. Like, I'm divorced once, so my divorce. You know, I'm in a good marriage now. But then you go into another marriage, and all of a sudden, if my marriage end was to end now, I'd be like, oh, what the shit? What the hell do I do? You know, I'm, I'm, I'm right. over fifty. What is it like when you have that? When you someone when it doesn't. When you had that string of it, just seemed some. I don't know if it's bad luck or bad chemistry. How do you how do you stay together as a band and focus that you guys know you're a great band? Well, I think you just hit it. You you know that 
that, that we are. As a unit, we're a really good band because we went through a lot of drummers too and we know we're a really good band. Sometimes things have strong starts and they peter out, you know what I mean? And um, I mean, things were going great with Johnny for years and then just things just didn't, you know? I, I, I'm not saying it's anyone's fault, but things just started not going as great as they were and we just decided we're like, hey man, you do your thing, we do our thing, whatever, and and that's that. But to, to answer your question, it, it is it's it's just like oh, we got to start this again, you know. And the the thing with Harnell, it was just a bad matchup, you know. Um, we had another guy that we wanted to get, but the fact that he lived in the UK, we're like, nah, it's just how are we going to pull this off? And then we end up getting ZP anyway, <laughs> you know what I mean? So. Um, and and th- this wasn't the first time ZP was brought up anyway. So um, when things didn't work out with Tony, and we we knew that was probably going to go that way anyway. Um, I forget whether Z called me or I called him because him, Rob Hammersmith, and I were supposed to put a side project together. And Rob and I flew to England, hung out with him, and that's where we first met him. And we just hung out you know, and drank some beer and, and whatnot for a few days. And then it just never materialized. Well, Z after this is right after he left dragon force. And then he started a band called IMI and they came out with skid row and opened for skid row. And then we became closer. And then when everything went down, um, I forget whether I called, I think he called me. He goes, okay. He goes, let's, let's cut the bullshit. <laughs> he goes, I think it's time for me to sing for Skid Row. And I go, oh, yeah, let me talk to the guys. And we'll, we'll try. And we got him over here. And it was just one of those things because he grew up, he's 10 years younger than us. And he grew up listening to us. You know, when we were 25, he was 15. And it, that's what he was listening to. He grew up in South Africa. It was us, Bon Jovi, you know, that, that whole deal. And uh, he was like, Hey, you guys want to do this song? We're like looking at each other. We're like, no, we don't know it. <laughs> you know, whatever song he's pulling out these deep tracks. Like, Give me a minute. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then it just started working really well. And we never, there was, I got to say, there was never a point with ZP where we didn't have 100% confidence in him on stage because he goes from this guy, because he's so mellow. He's so chill and laid back. And then he goes from this one guy and then walks out on stage and we call him the warrior. He just goes out and all of a sudden he's just like, he just tunes in, man. And he, he's there. He is so in the moment and it's infectious, you know, even for like old road dogs like us, you know, I mean, he, he tore, he tore substantially with dragon force. So he knew what that was all about, but you know, still 10 years younger we may be a little jaded to things and he came in and it lit a fire under all of our asses, man. And it just, it was seamless. It just came together so quick and it took all the stress out of it. It took all the stress out of everything. And just the response, the reaction, you know, just watching this guy do his thing. And, and I think his first show we were doing, um, it was, it was a decent sized show. It was like 4,000 at the, uh, Mohegan sun arena. And we were headlining, and and it was us and Slaughter, and I think someone else before them. And that was his first gig with the band. We're like, okay, trial by fire. And he went out and he kicked our asses. And I remember Scotty looking at me. He goes, "This guy's the best. <laughs> he goes, he's the best singer we've ever had, man." And he just and then walk off stage, and he's just like, "Yeah, man, let's do a shot of vodka." Anybody got a joint? You know, that kind of thing. He's just so chill. And uh, he's just a good dude. And he, it, it was, that was so just easy. So easy to do. So, you know, you've been around, you know, a great career. Do you still remember the first time you heard Skid Row on the radio? I know you heard it at the Tilt-A-Whirl at Seaside Heights, but do you remember the first time you uh, heard Skid Row on the radio? I do. I absolutely do. I tell the story a lot. They, I, I was, I was in New York. Um, they flew me there. We, because I, I think we were up. I forget who we were with. It, 
I think it was with Bon Jovi, and we were playing up in, um, I think it might have been Maine or New Hampshire. They're like, okay, yeah, I think it was Maine because I flew. Um, so, like, you got to get to New York because you got a bunch of press. There was me and I believe Snake. You guys got a bunch of press. So we're going to fly in New York on the day off and then fly up on show day. So we went down, and Snake and I kind of went our separate ways. I think he went home uh, after the press, and I just stayed in New York. I didn't feel like busting it or, or, or driving all the way back home and whatnot. So um, I went out with a few of my friends, um, Mary Gormley, who worked for Geffen Records, and Michael Alago. At the time, he worked for uh, uh, Electra. So we went out. We went to the Cat Club. And it was such a great night all around. So we're at the cat club and who's standing there, but Joey Ramon and my friend, Michael knew Joey. So he introduced me to Joey and I was just blown away because I was a punk rock kid. Like the Ramones were another band that had such a huge impact on me. And so I was like, this night can't get any better. So it went by, drank way too much. And I was like, man, I got to catch a flight in the morning. I got in the cab and I went back to the hotel well, it was hot out, so I had the window down, and we stopped at a light, and another cab next to me had WNEW on, which wasn't really, Skid Row wasn't really WNEW friendly at the time, but 18 and Life was out, and it was breaking, and I heard it coming out of the cab next to us, and I was just sitting in the back of the cab going, this is the best, <laughs> this is just so cool. You know, I'm, I'm like, I got flown down to do interviews because, like, you know, when you're a kid, you're like, yeah, I'm going to say this in the interview, say that in the interview, and this, you know, and I got flown down to do interviews, and now I'm in a cab in New York City listening to my band coming from another cab and watching the driver, like, bop his head to it, you know, it was, it was just such a cool moment, man. So, what's what's the future? I mean, with Skid Row, I mean, you, you know, we don't know what's going on with the pandemic. And, you know, I'm sure, you know, you guys travel a lot. And it's funny, the you know, through like with Rat, with that progressive commercial and all this music's coming back. Just the other night on NCIS, my friend Eric Palladino was talking about Quiet Riot. So this is this is all coming back. What, yeah. what, what do you see as a future for you guys? Well, we tour a lot. Like we do on the average 90 to 110 shows a year, right? Um, but now we, we, we've been writing to do a new record. We recorded some, we, we're just, we're not, we, we want to make a lot of changes to it. So we're going back in the studio. Um, we were actually supposed to be in the studio now, but Z's in the UK, they're on, under total lockdown. Um, we're, we're gonna, it looks like we're recording it with Nick Raskulinix, who, who's, a monster producer. Um, he uh, he's done Rush, Foo Fighters, Evanescence, Hailstorm. Maybe uh, just go down the charts and you'll see his name, Corn. You know what I mean? And he he gets us. And so we've been writing for that, and we're going to um, you know when we can go in the studio, you know, um, start pre production. And go in the studio, get this out, and just once business is back to normal, we're going to release a record and, and hit the road again. You know, this will be the first record with Z, and the anticipation from our fans is through the roof because you know he had he had his own celebrity before he joined the band, so um, everyone's really chomping at the bit for it, including the band. So we're uh, you know as soon as we get in the studio, that's the plan go and, and do this and hit the road. Now you played all over the world. You played huge venues. You've heard smaller venues. What for you do you personally like? I know some people musicians who really like an intimate space better because even though you feel the energy and the power coming from a stadium or a packed arena, sometimes they say you get lost in that. What What is your preference for playing live? Man, I, I, I just love playing live. Um, yeah, the big crowds are insane, you know. Um, but I, 
I just like them all. I really do. I just love playing live. We we don't do a lot a lot of smaller places. We we do a lot of casinos and stuff like that. And they're they're on the average they're probably about a thousand, which for a band that's been around as long as us, you know, that hasn't had an album out as long as we have. That's pretty pretty damn good. But we you know we not saying the festivals and the outdoor stuff. You know, we're a good one to five thousand capacity band. So I don't care. It's like, get, give me bigger, give me smaller. I, I just don't care. I just love playing live. And it, we're, we're just having so much fun doing it. it the, the attendance, the, the capacity doesn't really affect me. What, uh, one final question. You know, you've had the ups and the downs of the career, you know, different band lineups, you know, the change of grunge to, you know, that whole scene. What has what has kept you sane? What has made you stay besides the love of the music? I mean, there had to be some really crazy times because when you go from seeing yourself on MTV and you're walking down the street and people are like, "Oh my God!" You know, how how have how have you kept yourself sane over the years? Well, you have to start off that way. You know what I mean? Um, I, I was I was always kept grounded no matter what it was by my parents you know I, I always had a close relationship with them and my dad said something to me he's like man like and both my parents are like once I started making money and and stuff like that they're like all right you need to you know save it whether you invest whether you do you know just squirrel it in a bank don't just blow through your money and my dad said this he goes because the train isn't going to run forever. He goes, so I hope it runs really long, but it's never going to run forever. So just just keep that foresight. And that <laughs> that resonated. And so he kept me grounded. My parents kept me grounded. So it was like when shit wasn't happening the way it used to, it, it wasn't really a big adjustment for me because I never lived extravagantly. I always lived well inside my means. And if things did go bad, I just made adjustments for it. You know, um, that, that's how I kept my sanity because I never let it, I never took anything I did. I mean, I, I, I took it seriously as my craft and, and I wanted to put out good songs, but I never took it as well. If this were to end tomorrow, it's not like I couldn't get a job easily at home Depot. I could totally do that. You know, I was in construction before this. I didn't go back into construction. You know what I mean? So that that was always kind of my outlook. It's a Jersey outlook. You know, it's a, it's a, people don't understand that there's a certain there's a certain thought process in Jersey. That you just you know, I always laugh when I lived in LA and, and you'd work somewhere and people would be like every day late. And it's like in New Jersey, if if you're late once, you're yelled at. If you're late a second time, you're fired. And there was like no ands, ifs, or buts, even if there was snow on the ground or whatever. It's like how do you, how do you know you could fight? You get your ass kicked a couple of times. You know what I mean? <laughs> well, dude, I want to thank you for talking to me, Rachel. Uh, now, the, the website skidrow dot com. How can people get in touch with you? Are you out there on social media? I am. I have my um, you know. I, I'm on Instagram. That's it. Uh, uh, official Rachel Bolin. I do have my other Instagram. Is actually funny as it sounds. Is my soap company. I started a soap company called Dirty Rocker Soap. And so that, that I have a website for that. It's all, all natural soap line of soap. And, um, that's dirty rocker soap co.com. If anyone wants to check that out, but yeah, I'm just the, the only social media I have is Instagram. So people check out Rachel, check out his soap. You know, it's good. Soaps are good. I used to go to a place in Burbank and we get this uh, watermelon grapefruit soap that smelled so damn good. And it was a crazy lady. This crazy lady sold it at the farmer's market and she would talk to you for like nine hours. And you're just like, I just want the goddamn soap. (laughs) (laughs) Breathing in too many live fumes. Exactly. So people check out Skid Row, check out Rachel, uh, check out my website, coopertalk.net. You can find over 830 episodes up there. Email me, Cooper, coopertalk.net. I'm Twitter, at coopertalk. Instagram, at coopertalk1. Remember, I'm Steve Cooper. I'm only as hip as my guest. Don't forget, drink your water, eat your vegetables, take your vitamins, and I'll talk to you guys next time.